Well, on these cold days here in the South last week, OG, I thought to myself, man, is this bad? Life is bad when you're in a house that's not made for these temperatures. And then you look at all of our friends in Houston and Southern Texas and people, these stories you're hearing about people out of power for long periods of time and pipes bursting and stuff. And I think, man, they got it bad. And then you know what I think? I think about these people out on Navy ships on these long cruises defending the country. And then I think my life's not, not so bad after all. Things are pretty good for me because of a lot of these people. So on behalf of Navy Federal Credit Union, our team here at Stacky Benjamins, we want to start off the show today with a big Navy Federal shout out to our men and women serving in the armed forces. Thanks for all that you do. Let's go stack some Benjamins. So faced with the question, where did they go next with this podcast? The guys were recently joined by legendary musical genius, Bruce Dickerson, who's agreed to be the new producer of the Stack and Benjamin show. They were all excited to meet him. Hey fellas, I'm Bruce Dickerson. Yes, the Bruce Dickerson. You have a dynamite sound, fantastic sound. I have only one suggestion. More cowbell. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we all know that systems and processes are the only way to grow a great business. But what about for your family budget? Here with business case studies that you can use in your life to get ahead, we welcome Mr. Built to Sell Radio, John Warlow. Plus, the GameStop-related lawsuit slinging has begun. Who's suing who? We'll share that and what advisors are thinking about Bitcoin during our headline segment. Later, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Zach, who has a question about his individual stock investing strategy. And I'll save time for my stellar trivia. And now, two guys who did a horrible job setting this podcast up to sell. It's Joe and oh, J-J-J-J-G. It turns out it was about systems and not about just frugality. Well, there's always a price. It's just not going to be a great price to sell it right now. <laughs> Maybe we need to listen to today's guest. John will help us a little bit. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lowballing Podcasters for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table from me, the man, the myth, the legend with coffee, Mr. OG. Yeah, running a little low. We're recording this a little early, but uh, we're hoping to get to the grocery store this week. I see you got your hair done and everything. Uh, oh, I guess so, huh? That's... Pretty, got pretty amazing. <laughs> like a hurricane going on there. <laughs> we have a fantastic guest today, a guy that you like a lot, I like a lot, a man who knows systems to build businesses as well as anybody. John Warlow is with us today, OG. Love that book. Built to Sell. I love parable books. They just, yeah. they just stick with me. Well, he's got a new one, The Art of Selling Your Business. And it's funny because I think a lot of our listeners are going to go, what does it have to do with me? You and I know that when you look at yourself as the company CFO and you set up your business around systems, your family around systems, and so you can focus on your family. You know, it's funny, we have the, the not to go right to one of our advertisers, but we got the Avon Lifeline talking about do what matters, don't spend time filling out life insurance applications. It's also not thinking about your Roth IRA or wondering what your tax strategy is, or figuring out your retirement number over and over and over and over, OG. It's about about living your life. Yeah. Build the systems around it. I like it. We got great stuff here. John Warlow's here today. But first, OG, next Wednesday night, you want to mark your calendar because we've got a huge event. Our third stack happens. And as you know, from the planning of this thing, uh, OG, from our planning meetings, this is going to be the best one yet. 
fantastic Wednesday night. Now, who's going to be there? What's it all about? Well, here's what we decided to do now, stackers. The first time we brought you four industry experts to help you rebuild your Benjamin stack. That was a lot of fun. Last time we brought you Silicon Valley's magician for billionaires talking about how he had to pivot during the time of COVID and with lessons about pivoting in your life, which so many people had to do in 2020. We also brought you a reformed drug dealer, Michael Sanchez, with an amazing story. And then, of course, the grandmother of the fire movement, Vicki Robin. Who do we have this time? What lessons are we going to teach this time? Oh, gee, we have something new going on. We're keeping it a secret. Do I get to know? <laughs> you already do know. Oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it is... So I is, just didn't know if this is one of those like game night things like, oh, yeah, it's game night again. Yeah. Hot or cold. This is going to be a fantastic. We have a fantastic lineup of guests, a great guest co-host who's going to join OG and I. 75 minutes of fun. You want to be there or be square. Yeah, it's all live on YouTube. We're going to give away books. Also, if you sign up early so mom knows that you're coming so she can make sure that we're all ready for you. We're also going to give you some helpful tools that will also be hints as to who our big guests are going to be. Big names, lots of learning, but more than anything, fun hanging out with all of our basement characters. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash stack. That is Wednesday, March 3rd. The fun starts at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. If I got my math right, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stack. Get on the list in a hurry because we're sending out some cool tools to everyone who tells us they're coming. All right. That's the stack. Going to be a lot of fun. Let's get today's show started with some, uh, some pretty wild headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamins headlines. Our first headline comes to us from the gaming site Polygon. Written by Owen Good. The hits just keep coming, OG. This is what happens every time there's money involved in a situation. Roaring Kitty, Reddit investor, sued over roll in GameStop stock surge. Oh, boy. Lawsuit alleges that Keith Gill, quote, is no Robin Hood and made more than $48 million for himself. One of the principal figures in a group of Reddit investors who drove a huge surge in GameStop share price in January is being sued in federal court in a class action complaint alleging securities fraud. The lead plaintiff, a Washington state investor, suffered, quote, substantial financial losses when he used $200,000 to speculate on GameStop's price when the company stock was below 100. It then went skyrocketing to a record closing price of 347.51 on January 27th in a story that caught mainstream media's fascination for more than a week. The lawsuit says Keith Gill of Massachusetts, known on Reddit, is deep effing value. And on YouTube, is Roaring Kitty is a shrewd investor representing himself as an average Joe who beat big time investors at a shady game. Lawsuit says Gill instead made $48 million cashing out from his day job as a licensed trader with Mass Mutual in Boston. Individual suing Gill, Christian Iovan, alleges Gill was illegally manipulating GameStop's share price by encouraging his YouTube and Reddit audience to hold other shares of GameStop, causing what's called a short squeeze that artificially spike the price. Whenever there's money to be made and somebody loses, how many times over the last nine years, OG, have we seen this happen? Yeah. Something happens, people start suing people. I read this article. I read what this uh, trader did. He didn't lose. He just bet wrong. So what he did was he sold a call option, which when you sell something in the market, you have some obligation in the future. So he had an obligation to provide those shares at 100 bucks to somebody else. And he's saying, because I had to give them to somebody else at 100 when it was really trading at 400 I lost out on that $300 a share. But when you sell a call option, when you sell that type of derivative, you get paid in cash today. So that's the bet that you make. You make the bet that, hey, I'm going to take this cash today in exchange for no future upside. So if you let's do this with a normal company like Apple. So Apple is trading at $130. If you think that 
Apple's not going to trade above $140 by April. You can sell the right to somebody to buy it to you, from you for 140 bucks in exchange for that promise, in exchange for that promise that you gave that said, hey, I'm going to give this to you at 140 Somebody has to give you cash today. That's the exchange. So he probably got some, not some money, he probably got a substantial amount of money, especially if GameStop was under 100 at the time, and it was volatile because it's priced on volatility. So, you know, it's not like he got, he didn't get anything. He just bet incorrectly. But he still, if he did deliver shares through somebody, if somebody went ahead and bought that call when he was, when it was trading at 300, let's say, yeah. uh, he's, he's still eating it big time. I'm sure that call, the premium he got for selling that call, the amount of money he got for selling it was nothing compared to what he had to deliver. Yeah. And that's the same sort of strategy that, the allegedly the hedge funds were doing, which was selling it short. He effectively was selling it short at a hundred saying, Hey, at 50, I'm going to sell it short at a hundred. It's never going to go to a hundred and it goes to 200. Now he's left holding the bag going, "Uh Oh, I got, I got to get out of this. Somebody's going to come knocking on my door going, Hey, you promised to give me a whole bunch of stock at a hundred dollars share. It's at 200. I want that. But that happens every day. That happens that, all that the time. sort of trade happens hundreds of millions of times a week. And this dude got it wrong. Now, I don't know anything about uh, uh, Keith Gill. I don't uh, really care to. I do know that he's a CFA, which means that he's taken some advanced coursework and advanced licensing in uh, security analysis. And as I understand it, he wasn't actually an advisor at Mass Mutual, but more of a tech uh, person around uh, trying to create programs and stuff for for investors. So he was licensed, but he wasn't, you know, an advisor. So yeah, he's probably going to have some reckoning for the um for the fact that he was licensed and kind of running this side business that nobody knew about, but how is this different than any other sort of trading website or newsletter subscription you can buy or freaking Twitter? I mean, this guy bet wrong and and lost. Was there anybody who didn't think that this guy was making money? I mean, he seems to be. He publicized it every He publicized day. everything he was doing the whole time. Yeah. And what what's what's more interesting is if it really was a long con, right? If it was, it took him like the better part of a year and a half to pull it off. Yeah, and I was just thinking a family member of mine thought he got in late and he got in November. Yeah, well, this guy was posting about it back in early 20 and mid 2019 and everybody called him fo- uh, you know he's like oh you're a fool oh you're a fool and he's like no this is my rationale behind it it wasn't obviously the short selling had an impact on that but it was you know he laid his case out a couple of times of like here's why I'm doing this and here's what I think you know the the business is cash flow positive and land is worth whatever and all this other sort of stuff i, I mean for everybody out here who who is elbow deep and Benjamin Graham that's that's security analysis by Benjamin Graham but the value of the organization of the parts pulled apart is worth more than the stock price then you've got a value stock like if you the land and the cash flows and the you know all the equipment and all that sort of stuff if you could sell it all for more than the value of the stock then guess what the stock's undervalued you got a discount that's a Benjamin Graham thing. And that was kind of his point. I don't think that he expected it to go to freaking $450 a share, which by the way, to my knowledge anyway, I don't think he sold all of it at that point. Now he sold some along the way, but anyways, nevertheless, this is part of the problem with, with litigation. I think that there's a need for people who are manipulative and uh, people who do things incorrectly, who are wrong, you know, cheats in the system and so on and so forth. This you know, to be punished. But if you look up this company's this law firm's website or follow their Twitter posts, they literally, every stock that goes down, they tweet about it. Like, hey, did you own this stock and it went down? We can sue for it. Hey, did you own this stock and it went down? Nah, we can sue for it. Hey, did you own this stock and it went down? We can sue Which for it. Which is often the case. It's not even this particular investor. It's the firm doing what they do best. It is. And, you know, by naming this dude, they put a face to it, and then they also imply that Mass Mutual had something to do with it. And Mass Mutual is, you know, not dumb. They have tons of attorneys and lots of money, so they're going to say, "Yeah, just make this go away. Here's a million dollars, you know." And the law firm's going to get their thirty percent, and you know, off they go. And I mean, to disparage law firms that do this for clients, because there are 
lots of places and times and opportunities where people are misbehaving and and that's what it's for. But this is a little bottom feedy for me. Our second headline also going to the get rich quickers among us. Uh, a piece I saw in Investment News OG. Advisors agree it's time to stop ignoring Bitcoin. Another headline. That now that it, now that it's at fifty two thousand. Well, that's that's the thing. Does this this feel so reactionary? We spend so much time telling people what is a what does a pro do? A pro does not respond to anything. A pro does not react. A pro has a plan going in and then adjust in a systematic way through an investment policy statement. Any advisor right now going, oh yeah, I think I got to tell people to get into Bitcoin, goes back to 2020. Remember the story that you told about the advisor who sold all his client stuff on the worst day? Yeah. Just uh, why advisors saying now it's time to stop ignoring Bitcoin? Especially because it went from three thousand to fifty two thousand, <laughs> and they've all sat down and done the math. But here's the thing: first of all, it's not like when Bitcoin was at three thousand, you could have an honest discussion with most of your clients and go, "Listen, I think we're going to put five percent of our portfolio in this." <laughs> they would have, you know, been like saying, "Hey, Tesla's at seventy bucks. We'll sell everything and put it in Tesla." Like, who would? You can fantasize about that. You know, the past always sounds really rosy when you cherry pick all the good stuff that happened in it. And then you apply your situation to that and and what if it to death. Yeah, I I mean, it would have been great if I would have picked all six numbers correctly in the Powerball a couple weeks ago, too. You know, you'd have called and been like, hey, are we recording? Are you coming over to the basement to record? And the phone would have been like, do, do, do. We're sorry. The number you've called has been disconnected. You know, we can all fantasize, Joe. Yeah. But my point is, is that... In no real world does that exist. Yeah, I, you know what? Listen, I wish, hand to God, I wish that during the recession in 2008 and 9, and also this more recent one, I wish I would have like literally taken all of the available credit I had, all cash advanced, and dumped it all into Tesla options. I sold I, your house. I, I wish. Lived in a no, tent. Yeah, I didn't even have to do that. I could have just taken all the I would have done equity, that. I mean, if I could and, see back into the past, I would have totally done that. I would have taken all my mom's money. I would have called my dad and I'll take all his money, all my family. I would have taken your money, everybody's money, and put it in Tesla options and Bitcoin. God, I wish I would have done it. But guess what? I didn't. You know why? Because it would have been effing stupid to do. Well, you know what you do next? You didn't do it, so you sue Elon Musk. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly right. what you got to do. Yeah. Duh. But think about this from a, you know, we talk about like people have a plan for this. Think about this from a, an actual logical investment policy statement type of question. If you believe like we do that, you know, you can't control or predict the future, that we don't know which stocks are going to outperform. We don't know which countries are going to outperform. Therefore, we should have a lot of everything and we should be pretty well diversified. Using that theory, you could argue and say, well, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or whatever should be a part of that because it's a, it's, it's some part of the of the world's, you know, investment allocation, so to speak. Fine. What percent is it? You know, you say, well, the the U.S. GDP is 55% of the world's GDP. So maybe 55% of our money should be invested in the U.S. If you think of that, maybe there's a little home bias. So using that logic, what's the number for Bitcoin? I don't know it off the top of my head, but the number is in the decimals of percents. Yeah, 0.5, 0.7, maybe 1%, you know, the total market cap of Bitcoin is under a trillion, right? It's like 900 billion. So that puts it in line with like the same size as like a Tesla or half of an Apple. You wouldn't put all of your, well, some people did put all their money in Tesla. Some people, you know what I mean? Yeah. So should you have some? Eh, Maybe, maybe not. Should you put all of your money in it? Probably not. But if you're going to, and you were thinking of it like an investment and thinking of it like your investment policy statement, what would you do? It might be a half or a 1% weighting. Put it in your sandbox account. Or that, yeah. I thought, it, there. listen, there is no such thing as timing the market, right? Because like as you said, the his, history will always show that when you try to time the market, you're wrong. But it does seem weird. goes from 5,000 to 50,000. And all, there's this piece of it. Oh, hey, we should pay attention to this. But on the same damn day, OG, there's another headline at Yahoo Finance. This is written by uh, Jamie Crawley. Bill Gates says he's neutral on Bitcoin. The big thing here, though, is that 
Gates points out that the volatility of Bitcoin driven by, quote, mania and the difficulty of predicting how prices will progress is part of the problem. And the fact that it has to be if you're using it as a currency and people are buying it as an investment, you have the same dichotomy that we've talked about over and over on this show. Right. Is it investment? And, and should I load up on it or is it a, if, if it's a currency, I need to be able to buy a sandwich with it. Yeah. I can't buy a sandwich with something going from 5,000 to 50,000. I can't do it. Like, why the hell would I spend a Bitcoin on something when I can take a dollar I know isn't going to appreciate out of my wallet and buy my sandwich? Yeah. He I was also, just reading. A, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, he also says just one more thing. He says that he would short Bitcoin if there was an easy way to do it. At this point, he would short Bitcoin. I take that back. I'm sorry. This is I, I just read the end of that quote. That was from 2018 that he said he would short Bitcoin. Uh, well, sh- well, there you go, Bill. <laughs> Good job. Look at look <laughs> nice at market happened. timing. I mean, and, and so clearly Bill Gates doesn't necessarily have his arms around Bitcoin. But when I look at smart people and they're going, ah, man, I don't know. It just, it just tells me that advisors saying, Hey, we need to, we need to ramp this baby up at the same time. Same day. Gates is saying, I don't know. I'm neutral. Well, yeah, and that's and and we use the word advisors in air quotes because that's really not being an advisor. That's being True. A, a broker. You know what I mean? That's being a. It's that's no different than a portfolio manager getting to the end of the quarter and going, "What was the number one stock this quarter? Oh my god, it was Tesla. We don't have any Tesla. Let's buy a whole bunch of Tesla the last day so that when our quarterly numbers post, and everybody goes, "What did you own?" You can go, "Yeah, look at all the Tesla we have." Like that's. It's just make, you know, what do they say? Lipstick on a pig. It's trying to make it look pretty. But if you were looking at this from an investment perspective, which I'm with you, I don't know how you can use it as a currency, right? I mean, could you imagine? What would you do with your dollar? This is what I was going to say. I was reading this book called The Storm Before the Calm. It's written by this uh, futurist guy. His name is George Friedman. And uh, I really liked his other book that he wrote maybe about 10 or 15 years ago called The Next 100 Years. He talks kind of lays out like what the century is going to look like in terms of progress and technical advancements and so on and so forth. So this book, The Storm Before the Calm, was all about the U.S. cycles anyways. But he goes into detail in a couple of different times where the U.S. currency, when the dollar ebbed and flowed so greatly because of it being backed by gold and that being backed by silver and then it being backed by gold and silver and then being backed by nothing and then banks collapsing and like the impacts that that had. And to your point, when it was backed by gold early on, people were like, yeah, I'm going to hold on to this because I'd rather have gold than money. And since I can go trade this money in for gold, I'm not going to spend it. You know, so when it's an investment, you tend to hang on to it. You know, I mean, you've heard the stories of the people who bought pizzas with 10,000 Bitcoin and all that sort of stuff. You don't want to be that story, you know? If it's going to go from five thousand to fifty thousand, or fifty thousand to two fifty, you don't want to be the guy that's like, "Yeah, I, I spent a third of a bitcoin on a car, and now that car's worth ten million dollars in bitcoin." <laughs> you know, that's you don't want to do that. <laughs> so, so you'd hold on to it. I'm just thinking if I bought that old Ford Aerostar I had a long time ago, the one that I I uh, ended up donating to charity after it was just done, and I'm thinking. I'm thinking if I bought that with Bitcoin. Well, there was a story not too long ago about this guy. It was a billionaire who did the first Bitcoin transaction. Do we talk about this? You did about the Tahoe property? Yeah. And now it's worth, you know, $100 million or something in Bitcoin. It's like, you don't want to be that guy. No. So if you're going to have it, small percentage. You know who you want to be, though, Ochi? You want to be somebody that has a good dashboard when it comes to managing your money. Because managing your money, as you know, has typically been complicated, time-consuming, and just another reason to bite your nails. But for half a million investors who have accounts with M1 Finance, investing smarter, more automated, and easier than ever, do yourself a favor this year. Check out M1. This finance super app is designed to be personalized for your needs. Their automation tools make it simpler to reach your financial goals with M1 You can invest how you want with access to fractional shares and unmatched automation for free. You can borrow against your investments at super low rates, just two to three and a half percent. Use this flexible portfolio line of credit for anything like investing more into your portfolio, refinancing other loans or funding large projects. M1 ties it together in a free digital account so you can have more flexibility and smoother money movements. Just keep in mind. 
Borrowing involves higher risk and rates may vary. Visit m the number one finance.com forward slash SB to sign up and get $30 to invest because you're a stacker and there is no and. That's it, OG. Again, that's visit m1finance.com forward slash SB to sign up and all stackers are going to get $30 to invest that uh, do sign up. Terms and conditions apply. I think our lessons, number one is Lose a little money in the stock market, go sue somebody, OG. There's a good idea. Been meaning to call the attorney. <laughs> I got to do that about my cannabis stock. Yeah, <laughs> you and me both. I've had a lawsuit there for quite a while. That was a big swing and a miss on my part. Then our second takeaway, work from an investment policy statement when you're creating your investment portfolio. Don't react and decide, hey, I got to do something with this. Put together a more comprehensive plan and you're not going to make mistakes. And then- You might not have to sue anybody. John Warlow is a guy that, uh, OG, you and I have known for a long time. I'm very excited. He was one of these guys that I'm just proud to uh, say that he's a friend of ours. He has built and sold businesses himself, so he knows what it takes to have the systems to build value. And for business owners, he created the value builder system, which is a simple software for building the value of a company. And it's used by thousands of businesses worldwide. In fact, uh, what you do is you keep working on your company, OG, till you get a score of over 90. And then you know that your business is set to sell. When it comes to this, I know there's people already thinking, I don't own a business. This one's not for me. We're not going to really talk about business today. We're going to talk about some of the correlations that we can make between setting your business up to sell and setting your family up for financial success. So whether you're planning your retirement, like somebody who's selling their business, or you're somebody who's just trying to make things hum better so you can live your life more, we're going to talk about all that. John Warlow on today's show. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our friend, John Warhello. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm great. I'm sorry you got to sit across the room, but mom adheres uh, to the rules. Yeah, absolutely. You have to, right? Social distancing. Absolutely. But I'm glad that you included us on the book tour. Why did you, you of course have the best seller, Built to Sell. You had a follow-up book, which actually was amazing that we can talk about too. But why this book, The Art of Selling Your Business? Built to Sell came out and I started a podcast called Built to Sell Radio. I've done something like 300 episodes. One of the things I noticed that most of the entrepreneurs I interview have kind of regular exits. They go for multiples that are pretty industry standard. And then there's this sort of cohort of my case studies, interviews that trade at multiples of revenue. Like they they are way outside of the box in terms of what is normal for their industry. And so I got to thinking it would be cool to to try to deconstruct what they do, these, these entrepreneurs who are selling for multiples of revenue. And, uh, and that's what started the journey. And and that's what ultimately became the art of selling your business. I want to ask you some questions about that later. Some of the things, especially that surprised you that some of the outlier people are doing, but I'm very fascinated about the idea of just built to sell John, because of the fact that when I was a financial planner, I got great lessons from looking at how businesses operate and how good businesses operate. And I know in Built to Sell, really, your whole focus during that book was about that same thing. Set up set up your business so it gives a better value proposition to people so that it's worth more, right? I mean, isn't that contextually what you're trying to do to sell a business? Effectively, yes. You want to create it so that it doesn't rely on you. It's an independent entity. And, and that's in many ways, the same thing you're trying to do when building out a wealth plan, but we can talk more about that. But yes, that is the essence of building to sell. When you've sold businesses and you've sold several businesses, is my understanding, the early businesses, what were some of the mistakes you made? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> so many. <laughs> He's I like, do you got one, time for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember one, I, w- I was building a, a quantitative market research business. We had built- Like us all. Both- What's that? I said, like us all. Yeah. Well, we did, we did quantitative market research, like, you know, uh, telephone surveys, internet surveys, 
And we had about five or six million bucks worth of revenue. We had clients like some of the best blue chip clients, Microsoft and Bank of America, they're really good clients. And I went down to see a guy named Perry Mealy in his office in Toronto. And Perry's an M&A professional. And I was kind of walking into the office super confident, right? Like, I've got this amazing business. It's going to be worth the truckload. And I say, Perry, five million bucks in revenue. What are we worth? Right. And I'm waiting for the, you know, the stack of Benjamins, the, yeah, you know, the, the yeah. big number. And Perry says, well, before you answer that question, let me ask you two questions. And I say, shoot, great. Your market research company, question number one, well, who does the research? And I'm like, my research guys do the research. And he's like, you're telling me like Bank of America hires you to do research and you're not overseeing that work. And I said, okay, fine. I'm involved in the research. Right. And then he's like, okay, question number two, who does the selling? Oh, those are my sales guys do the selling. And he's like, You've got clients like American Express. Don't you think that if American Express calls, you're personally taking that call? And I'm like, all right, fine, sure. I'm involved in the selling. And so Perry responded by saying, all right, John, well, here's the deal. You've got a market research company where you're doing the selling and you're doing the research. I got bad news for you. I can't sell your company. It's worthless. And I was like, punched in the gut, right? Just absolutely crestfallen. Coming into his office thinking I had this huge business leaving feeling like it was worthless. And so that was my introduction to what actually drives the value of a company with, versus what I was perceiving to drive the value of the company. Long story short, I, I, I transitioned that company into a recurring revenue business, one like a little bit like a mini version of a Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters. And ultimately, Perry was able to sell the company um, to a publicly traded company. So it had, a, it had a happy ending, but it was a very bitter pill to swallow when I first heard that. I've got 50 specific questions there. And, and, <laughs> and I love this is a case analysis for building personal wealth, because it sounds like what he's saying, John, is the first thing you've got to do is exactly what he kind of trapped you with. It sounds like by taking yourself out of the company, I mean, same way to build wealth, right? Take yourself out of the process, automate things. Well, not only automate things, but you want it working without you, right? So you want basically your wealth to be stacking on itself, right? Those little uh, army of dollars building and, and expanding over time through the magic of compound interest. You want that to be happening without you, right? So once you build an amount of wealth, it starts to build on itself. Same thing is true of the business, right? You want the business to grow to a point where it can succeed without you. I had not done that in that business. It was still dependent on me. And, and equally, I think, you know, some people who are still in the very early days of wealth accumulation you know, they haven't reached that that threshold where, the, where their, their account starts to take on a life of its own, yeah. independent of the hours they put into work, et cetera. What's interesting about that is in, in the U.S. anyway, your money's so much more tax advantaged. So when you when your money and I'm borrowing this from a guy, Robert Kiyosaki, I'm borrowing his sure. analogy. So I'll apologize, Robert, for stealing it for this <laughs> discussion. But when your money goes to work with its lunch pail every day, it's being taxed less than you are. So actually building that more quickly makes you much more efficient. But I'm also thinking, just backing away, John, when you take yourself out of that equation, you start thinking about where I fit. You talk to people in the business of selling businesses all the time. That must get them thinking, where's my role? And I would guess that role has to be in building a better engine. Instead of how do I do the selling, how do I create a better mousetrap? Is that true? Yeah, absolutely true. I, you know, I learned this one the hard way. I, I got invited to a, a conference, a uh, thing called Birthing of Giants. It's been rebranded EMP. It's in at MIT's Executive Education Center, 60 entrepreneurs in the room. And in we had speakers like Jack Stack talking about open book management and, and uh, Pat Lanchoni talking about leadership. And in walks the final speaker of the day. And I'm in this auditorium, this kind of amphitheater thing. And he starts off with a question. He says, look, how many of you guys, guys name was Stephen Watkins. He says, Watkins says, okay, how many of you guys are involved in the selling of your product or service? And like every one of our hands raised up in the air, right? Proud of ourselves for being rainmakers for our company, right? And, you know, he took a long pull on his water and he said, all right, you've got all the right skills to be an entrepreneur, but you're selling the wrong product. And it kind of everybody leaned forward on their chair and said, what, what are you talking about? He's like, you've got all the right skills, but what you should be doing is investing your sales and marketing skills in building the value of your company, selling to your company, talking to investors about why your company's great, not to customers, hire salespeople to sell to customers. You should reserve your selling talents for your company. You know, I always remember that lesson because it felt like 
you know, when you want, like you think, ah, oh, like I'm a pretty good basketball player. And then you actually watch a professional game and you go, I am completely terrible <laughs> relative to <laughs> the professionals. It was like, I'd been given a glimpse into what actual entrepreneurs think about. And that I was, uh, I had been playing an amateur's game before. That's, that is a huge aha. And while on one end, it's a real kick in the teeth on the other. I think that's a nice splash of water wake up call, John. It absolutely is. It absolutely was. It certainly was for me. And so the, the whole idea of building a company that is, is basically working while you sleep that, that same yeah. notion of building wealth. The other piece, I think the, the, the other nice parallel between building wealth and building a business is, is this notion of what we refer to as the Switzerland structure, where in a business, you don't want to be overly dependent on any one customer employee or supplier. Mm. We give it the name, the Switzerland structure, because of course, Switzerland is, is the kind of famous for independence, right? Like it's a butt of a joke, right? Well, I'm going to be Switzerland on this, right? Very independent minded people. And I think the same is true of building wealth, right? Like if you're all Bitcoin, if you're all Tesla stock, well, those, that's, that's worked out well for you recently, but it is not necessarily the foundation of a great portfolio, right? You want diversity. You don't want to be overly dependent on any one stock, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of these sort of parallels, if you will. When you see business owners getting ready to sell their business, where do most of them need help? I think a lot of them need help answering the question, why do you want to sell? We, we talk about pull factors and push factors, but push factors are all the things that frustrate owners about their company, right? Tax, the IRS, employees, you know, regulation, all the stuff that are, is frustrating for entrepreneurs. Yet we have found the most successful, happiest entrepreneurs. And again, I think this is also true of creating financial independence. The most successful and happy entrepreneurs are the ones that think more about their pull factors, meaning what are they excited to go do? I remember I did a, a podcast with a guy named Sean Oshman. He was a, a Denver-based entrepreneur who had an IT consulting company, a couple million bucks in revenue, not a big company. But he decided on his 39th birthday that by the time he was 40, he wanted to be living on a sailboat. And so he got to think, okay, well, how am I going to do this? Here he's in landlocked Denver, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he, he figures this, well, there's no way I got to sell my company. So he goes to a broker, says, you know, sell my business. Ultimately, the broker comes back with an offer of between two and three times profit. And Oshman says, all right, well, as long as you can get me the cash before I, my 40th birthday, I'll take the deal. And I asked Sean after he accepted the sale and we talked about it on the, on the show. And I said, like, how do you feel about that? Because two to three times profit is like, it's an okay exit, but it's not like a, like a spectacular exit, right? It's not like front of the newspaper kind of exit. Yeah. And he says, I'm super happy. And I said, why are you so happy? He says, because I'm, li I'm living on my sailboat. And it was a good reminder to me that if you've got something you want to go to and you're excited about, it makes squeezing out every last nickel of value out of your company is actually a little less important if you're excited to go do something. Are there, though, for him, and by the way, it, it, clearly that's the same thing with people working in nine to five, right? People show up all day. They work all day. They get really excited, excited about retirement, John. But as you know, they get excited because it's finally ending and I don't have to get up anymore. And then two years later, like I don't have any statistical proof, but you see all these people that pass away. And I feel like Absolutely. having this sailboat, having this dream, this thing out there keeps you rolling when, especially for an entrepreneur, this is all they've done. I mean, this is, yeah, this has been your heartbeat. Absolutely. Absolutely. A scary stat for us. 76% of business owners one year after selling their company regret the decision to sell. Wow. 76%. 76%. Wow. I mean, this should be, this should be like the happiest day of their lives. They should commemorate it like a birthday or a wedding anniversary, right? This is, this is the sale of their company. Yet three quarters of them a year after selling regret. And the number one reason they regret is they had more push factors than they had pull factors. Uh, the second most important reason is that their ego is still so entwined with their company, right? It, they weren't able to separate their ego from the company. And, and that's another reason. The third reason, and again, this comes very much into the financial piece. The third reason they tell us they end up regretting is that they think they left money on the table. And the biggest reason they feel that way is they didn't create a competitive marketplace for their company. When you get multiple bidders, 
you can feel fairly certain that there's a liquid market, right? There's yeah. a, there's a, it's not opaque. There's a liquid market and you've got a fair price for your company. When you deal with one acquirer, no matter how good the offer, you will always sit back and wonder, did I leave money on the table? And that's one of the biggest reasons. So I think if you could tackle those three things, your ego, making sure you get competitive offers, and of course, having more pull and push, I think you're setting yourself up for a very happy exit. But not all owners do that. Yeah. You have a section of your book, speaking of that exit time, that discusses timing. And I'd never really thought about timing. Is, is, is timing super important when you decide it's time to go? Yeah, look, I mean, right now is one of the best times in history to sell a company. Money is effectively free. Interest rates are virtually nil. And what that has done is turbocharged the private equity world. So companies that are sort of, I don't know, valued somewhere around one to $50 million worth of value, the vast majority of businesses that sell, they will be bought by private equity groups. And private equity groups, their business model is enabled by interest rates. The lower the interest rates, the higher the value they can place on your company. And so right now, in an effort, the Fed is just pumping money into the system, keeping interest rates low in an effort to keep people solvent. But what that is also doing is making it virtually impossible for a private equity company to lose when they go and buy your company. And so there is a lot of activity. And what I think the biggest mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make is they ride it over the top, meaning they think that they're going to sell three years from now, five years from now, when they oh. when they reach that next plateau of revenue. And, and what they don't realize is that you can ride it over the top just as easily. I'm, I'm reminded of a, of a guy named Rand Fishkin, who I talked about in the book, and I interviewed him for my podcast. He built a company called SEO Moz, which is a search engine optimization software, built up to $5 million in revenue. And he got a call from a guy named Brian Halligan, who at the time is and is the co-founder of HubSpot, which is like an all-in-one marketing software. And they were a bit weak in SEO. And they said, man, I, we would love to buy your company, Rand. And Rand said, okay, what's your offer? And, and Halligan said, we're going to give you, we're going to offer you $25 million of cash and HubSpot stock. And Fishkin thought about this and in his mind heard that his company should be worth four times revenue, but he was expecting to go from five to $10 million of revenue the next year. So in his mind, he was like, well, when we get to 10, we're going to be worth four times 10 or 40. And so we went back with 40 to Halligan and Halligan said, no way, can't do it. And so Fishkin said, well, fine. And he decided to raise some venture capital. Now he got a bunch of money, invested in a bunch of products, went well beyond his sort of comfort zone. And ultimately the business started to bleed cash so much so that the VCs removed Rand as the oh, man. CEO. Oh. And I interviewed Rand and I said, man, like what's your Moz stock worth these days? And he said, probably nothing. And I said, what do you mean nothing? He said, well, VCs invest with preferred shares, which mean they get their preferred return before you get anything. And he based on the length of time the VC had held the stock, it wasn't likely that his Moz software stock was worth anything. And I said, what would that HubSpot be offered today based on the appreciation in HubSpot stock? And he said, Based on how well the HubSpot stock has performed, it would be worth close to $200 million. Holy cow. <laughs> so that's a very dramatic example of, of riding it over the top when, you know, we always think we're optimistic, right? Entrepreneurs sure. are optimistic and they always think tomorrow is going to be better than today. The best time to sell is when somebody's buying. And when you get a call from a guy like Brian Halligan saying, we want to buy your company, that's a really good time to pay attention. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking as you're talking, John, that there's another place where I like this is when we talk about getting into investments, having an exit strategy. We saw a lot of people involved in beating this hammer a lot the last few weeks and the GameStop thing rode it all the way up and then rode it all the way back down, right? No exit strategy whatsoever, even though I think that was more of a casino than anything else. But when it comes to, to selling your company, uh, I've, I'm trying to put myself in this seat that you see all the time on your podcast, which is I'm an owner who wants to take advantage of an opportunity, but I also am optimistic. How do I thread that needle between wanting to grow it even more? Because that's what I've done my whole life. 
And now's the time out. Like I, I think most people would, would always bet on themselves for the future, right? Does this go back again to, and I'm just thinking out loud here as I'm processing it. Does this go back again to having these, these pulls to having more things pulling you than pushing you out? Yeah, it, it does. But it also has something to do with what we call the freedom point. And the freedom point stated very simply is where the sale of your business after tax and commissions, if that will generate enough wealth for you to create enough income to live comfortably the lifestyle that you aspire to, you've reached the freedom point. And you may be saying, well, how do I calculate that? Well, you've heard obviously 4% rule. I mean, you, yeah. you must talk about it all the time. 3% rule. We talk about the 3% rule because it's it's a little safer. And so basically you're taking what you need in the way of income to fund the lifestyle that you envision multiply by 33, and that's your nest egg that you've got to accumulate. And when your company is worth after tax and proceeds that amount, you have to ask yourself, what's the point in continuing? Now, you may want to continue because you've got to create, you love the creativity, you love the camaraderie, you love the technical challenge, whatever it is. But but what getting to the next tranche of value will not do is create more financial freedom. And in fact, the more you hold your company the more you risk financial freedom. You know, I was reminded of this fact earlier. I, I interviewed a guy named Rob Walling who built a company called Drip. And Drip was in the um, in the software space where, where, again, like Rand, they sell for really high multiples. And he was starting to receive offers in the nine, if you can believe it, nine to 12 times revenue space. Wow. Little $2 million company. So you do the math on that and you realize that was the freedom point. And Rob is a young guy. He's got a couple of kids and he said, I'm out. It's too big a portion of my wealth to put it at risk every day. Because every day, if, if your company is 50, 60, 70% of your wealth, you're effectively the gambler at the Las Vegas yeah. craps table and you're all in every day. And you never know when the next pandemic, the next, you know, like storm or whatever crisis is going to happen that will essentially undermine that freedom. And once you've earned it, it, it just begs the question, maybe I should monetize it. Maybe I should make it real. Are there some key metrics that you look at when you're evaluating somebody's business and, and how much you think it can go for? Like I'm thinking about, you know, for us, like uh, many publicly listed companies, John, free cash flow is a big thing, right? If a person has a lot of free cash flow, they kept their debt low, like you are a stock on the rise. If you're a company with a lot of free cash flow, you can pivot much more quickly than ones that don't. What are what are some of the key metrics that you see entrepreneurs really need to drive to get that multiple up there to sell their business? Yeah, look, again, the financial buyer, so three types of buyers, and they think about valuation slightly differently. So individual investors are usually buying a job. They buy smaller companies, less than a million or two in value, and they're buying a job. So they're going to be looking at profitability, to your point. Private equity groups use debt, often borrowed from a bank, which they have to finance, in other words, pay back. And so the more predictable your future stream of cash is, the more subscription-based or recurring revenue you have, uh, the more of a niche you have, the more you know, gross margin you have, the more valuable they're going to be, your business is going to be in their hands because they can bank it. They can go to a bank and say, look, lend us the money because this business is bulletproof. And that to stop you, John, but, but well, I, I just did. But on that point, is that why you like subscription businesses so much is because of that type of buyer? Yeah, it de-risks it for an acquirer. Gotcha. Absolutely. Okay. And, yeah. and so that's what makes for, a, especially for a financial buyer, your business that much more valuable. The strategic buyer is a slightly different animal. The strategic buyer is, is buying your business for what it's worth in their hands. And that calculation is completely different. So I'll, I'll give you an example because I think it helps illustrate it. So I talked about a woman in the book and, and I interviewed her called Stephanie Breedlove. She built up a, a little payroll company that did payroll for parents who have a nanny to pay. And so if you've got a nanny, you've got to do go through all the government red tape to pay your nanny, right? Yet you call up paychecks or ADP and they're like, they, you know, like, forget about it. We don't want to do yeah. deal with this. Right. Yeah. And so Breedlove thought, Oh, cool. Why don't I set up a company that just does payroll for parents of a nanny? Anyways, 25 years later, she's built this company up to $9 million in revenue. So it's not like a, a juggernaut. It's not the next Google or next Facebook, next Tesla. It's a good solid business, $9 million in revenue. She's got 10,000 customers. 
And she decides it's time for her to leave. She's reached her freedom point and she wants to sell. So she goes to the landscape and says, who's out there that would want to buy my company? And she realizes care.com is, has got incredible reason to buy her business because care.com is like the Angie's list of care providers, right? You put in your zip code and it'll give you babysitters and whatever. Who's market. out there? Yeah. Yeah. All five-star rated. And care.com has 70, sorry, 7 million parents and breed love reasons, man, if 7 million parents, they all have to have payroll. They have to pay their nanny. And so she approaches them. Long story short, she manages to get an offer of care.com of $40 million for her $9 million, wow. which is crazy. But the, the postscript to the story is she doesn't settle there. She says, that's not enough. And she quantifies the value for care. She says, look, if 1% of your 7 million buy my payroll service, that's a business seven times the size of my company. Long story short, she sells it for $54 million. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. I could talk about these stories all day. And, and I just love so many parallels between the world of personal finance and, and the world of building a business to sell. The book is called The Art of Selling Your Business, Winning Strategies and Secret Hacks for Exiting on Top. It's some of the best and quirkiest and most enlightening interviews I think we've had, John, uh, from your show. But uh, books available everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Just the, if you like the stories and, and stuff, uh, built to sell.com. If you opt in top right corner, I think there's a button that says free gifts. You get a, a fresh episode every week. It's free. So it's a, probably you, best you, you also include, I believe, uh, worksheets too, right? So people can That's work right. through yeah. each one of the chapters. That's right. If you, yeah, if you, uh, if you opt in at built to sell.com, you get a workbook on how to apply this to your, uh, to your business. And we'll link to it at our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Last question. You've done so many episodes. I have to ask just one podcaster to another, my friend. Is there been an episode that really surprised you? Something where you showed up and and by the end of the episode, you're like, I didn't bargain for that at all. Oh man. I yeah, but it's funny. I <laughs> one of the biggest surprises I ever got was not when I was interviewing. It was when I was being interviewed. Oh. I, I won't say the name of the podcaster, but the guy started and he said, Warlow, right. Warlow, you're the, you're the douchebag who wrote Built to Sell. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'd never been called that in my life before. And he went on to kind of chastise me and criticize me for, for writing a book that was advocating people build the flip. And he was saying, this is the worst thing in the world. You know, the economy needs people to build the last. And With the microphone on, is the microphone on? Are you guys recording? Is this, is this yeah, live? Yeah, live. <laughs> And I didn't rebut his comment at the time, but see, I've thought about it a ton since. And I just, I fundamentally disagree with that idea. I think for most entrepreneurs, we, we do our best work when creativity is at a premium, when problem solving is hardest. And it's, it's usually the early days in a business, the first, certainly the first decade of a business after which, you know, oftentimes we become the biggest albatross a yoke around the neck of our company because we become more conservative, right? As our business becomes a bigger part of our wealth, we're like, oh, I don't want to really risk it. And it reminds me of the story of, of Joey Redner, who built a company, beer company called Cigar City Brewing Tampa, built it up and, and he kept having to refinance the company because the beer was successful. It was selling out every time he you know, built a bigger facility, the bank would say, okay, great. We're going to lend you another million bucks to extend the you know, facility. And after about three expansions, he just kind of threw his hands up in the air and said, no more. Like, I, I, I feel like a gambler just gambling it every day. And I've just won five consecutive hands and, and I'm not willing to bet it all on the sixth. And he decided to sell. And I don't think that makes him a douchebag. Like, I really think that our best days as entrepreneurs are in the earliest period. And that for many of us, we would be best served to create some value, monetize that value, put it into the bank so that, and, and invest it so that we're starting to have that little army of soldiers working for us when we sleep and then go do something else. Anyways, that's probably the most surprising, but it wasn't on the receiving end. It was, uh, it was when I was being interviewed. 
Hey, Stackers, I'm your host, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And, you know, all this talk with John Warlow about building your business to sell got me thinking about just how much the Stacking Benjamins podcast company missed that memo. But the good news is, Stackers, old Doug, as you know, is a business guru just like John. And today, I'm sharing the rescue plan with the whole world on how to get this business back on track. You want a case study? Well, how about these gems? Uh, I I think we need to apply more plastic surgery and anti-aging cream for the the whole crew. I know this is audio only, but I mean, have you seen these guys? If we do more YouTube, our audience size is going to recede faster than Joe's hairline. Number two, more camera filters. Look, you and I both doubt that suggestion one's going to be enough. So let's bust out some flowers or, you know, like those little sparkly things that pop up on the screen. I mean, who doesn't like flowers and sparkly things with their budget or GameStop talk? We're going to go from old to irresistible. Can I keep going? Oh, yes, I can, stackers. And I'll crank out the really good stuff after today's trivia. So here it is. Steve Jobs, the former CEO of Apple, was born on this date in 1955. You may recall that Apple became the first company with a trillion dollar market cap back in August of 2018. So today's question is, if Apple had the highest market cap then, which company has the highest market cap today? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can crack a book before you start your business. Throughout the 1900s, Coca-Cola grew into a multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation. They were beloved by many, especially Americans, which is why when they changed their recipe to what they called New Coke back in 1985, I don't want to give away, by the way, how old I am, but I will tell you, I remember this controversy and it was big. The backlash was swift and severe. Everybody I know was talking about old Coke versus new Coke and the man who drove it Chairman Robert Gozueta pulled new Coke from the shelves in just a few months. Wondery's Business Movers podcast explores how the reformulated new Coke disrupted Coca-Cola's public perception. The story new Coke is often seen as a classic case study for how not to launch a product in a cautionary tale of an out of touch executive who defied conventional wisdom and played a dangerous game with his company's signature product. But this is a cool thing. That's not the whole story. The real story, New Coke, is much more complex, way more human. The story of Robert Cozueta's improbable rise and his controversial decision to change the recipe for Coke starts decades before the launch of New Coke in the midst of a violent political revolution in Havana, Cuba. What I love about this whole crazy episode is the twist and turns that you don't expect. You know, there was even a piece of me that thought, did Coca-Cola actually manufacture this whole thing? Did they come up with this so that people would talk about Coke more? And uh, nope, a lot more going on there. So not just the Coca-Cola controversy, there's a ton of cool stuff. You listen to the newest season of Business Movers on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Wondery, feel the story. Hey, stackers, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, back with some business best practices to save this podcast. While some companies are hoping to go from good to great, I think we can all agree that these guys are hoping to go for, like, fair to middling. So, my third tip is, more Doug, of course, duh, we all know why you're here. Well, all of you except Tom Turk Toledo on iTunes, who says I should rein it in a little bit, but what does he know? He's from Ohio, like any successful business has ever happened there. We need to give the people what they want, Tom Turk Toledo. Longer intros, more trivia. That's what it takes to have a billion-dollar podcast right there. And finally, I think we need some more brown bags, specifically one for Joe Saul Cihai. I mean, all of the science and the facial up, you know, cream moisturizer things and the plastic surgery in the world ain't going to help that guy. Am I right? So put a brown bag on it, Joe. Can't hurt. I got one last tip, but you're going to have to wait until our takeaway for that. Back to our trivia question, which was this. 
What company has the highest market cap today? Coming in at number three at $1.85 trillion, it's Microsoft. Number two at $2.02 trillion is Saudi Aramco. But number one, are you surprised? It's Apple, again, at $2.27 trillion. Time for me to go finish up my list of suggestions. See ya! Thanks again to John for sharing some, some great analogies. Oh, gee. And I remember early in my career as a financial planner, one of uh, our trainers took us through some other businesses like Benny Hanna and how Benny Hanna operates. Very interesting. The early Benny Hanna's focused on the cooking. You can tell later Benny Hanna's because the bar area is much bigger because they realize that while the margins are low on food, the margins were huge on alcohol. And if they can create a little bit of a waiting line, so you go to get a drink and they make it warm and inviting for you to wait there. Notice in a mm-hmm. lot of Benihana's, the newer ones, the waiting area is kind of integrated into the bar. Yeah. It, it kind of feels very comfortable and easy to go over and get a drink while you wait. And uh, there were so many analogies there for companies and also for, for families. When John talked about retirement planning, man, did that just hit home this idea of what goals are pulling you. And you also see people do this, OG. They retire at the wrong time because all they think about is, I need to get out of here. I need to leave this, right? I need to, so they're pushed out, to use John's terminology, instead of pulled toward this thing that's, you know, you might, if you retire at 50 or 60, it could be another 30 or 40 years. It could be like a whole nother career worth of time. So much like you are in your 20s when you're excited to get started, on your career journey, I think you need the same excitement in your 50s or 60s when you're retiring. Well, and that's from a planning standpoint, or from a retirement standpoint, that's the big challenge, you know, is that you get so focused on the thing, you get so focused on the, I got to get to a million, I got to get to two million, I got to get to my number. You get there and you're like, uh, so this is it. So now what? Like, I thought there would be like some, you're just, like fireworks or a party or, I mean, I, I always try to find clients when, when they cross a milestone, right? If they're investing money and the first time they get to six figures, I try to, I try to catch it really close. Like, Hey, by the way, congratulations. Hey, you got a, you got an extra comma and you're, you know, you crossed into the million. Congratulations. Hey, you crossed. Another. And the response is always the same. Like, huh? Cool. Yeah, no, that's cool. And there's like, like, so what does that mean? So I went from 998,000 to a million and three dollars. I mean, it's awesome. It's cool. I guess it sounds great when you're hanging out at like 150 K in your retirement account, you go, I'd love to have a million. I don't know. What was it? You know, when you cross from 140 to 150, did you have a big celebration? Cause that's the same reality that happens when you go from 995 to a million five. It's like, yeah, okay. Still, still got to work tomorrow. Right. Still got to put the kids through college. Still got to pay off the house, you know, that sort of thing. So I like the idea of thinking about it from the perspective of kind of your why. What do you want to what do you want to get out of it? Strong, strong goals. Thanks again to John, and we'll we'll link to his new book, The Art of Selling Your Business, on our show notes page. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. We talked about this later. You don't want to spend time filling out life insurance apps. That's why our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency put what you value first, your loved ones and your time. And they made the process simple. It's all online. You get an instant coverage decision. Their prices are affordable. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life for more to get your life insurance done and to move on. Today, we're going to say hi to our friend, Zach. Say hi, Zach. Joe, OG, Stacking Benjamins crew. I put $20 a week into a somewhat random stock that has shown positive increase over the life of its trading. Good strategy or bad strategy? (laughs) Thank you, Zach, uh, for the, for the question. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because that is a question we've never had anything like before. That is not. And you see a stock OG, it just tends to go up. Momentum actually, Zach, is a real thing in the stock market when you talk to technical traders. So 
from that aspect, yeah, but I think there's a lot more to it, <laughs> OG. So his investment strategy is I put $20 a week into a stock that just happens to go up all the time? Random stock continually goes up. I put all my money in it. I know. You missed out, dude. Should have done it years ago. I think I would do a little bit more research than, than finding this one only goes up. You know, I mean, stocks tend to go up. That's the goal, right? I mean, of companies. But, um, you know, the problem with individual stock ownership is that a lot's on the line. I mean, if you're putting all of your money into one particular thing or one, one idea, one thesis, so to speak, you know, then that has to be right. And if it's not, then you're destitute. The key here, I think, for Zach, OG, isn't it, it's finding out why it's gone up because stocks don't just mysteriously go up for no reason. And I think you want to know the heartbeat of that stock a little better. So find out, is it the fact they have little debt and sales keep going up? Is it the fact that they've had some big things happen uh, to them recently? Is it uh, management changes that happen? Like, I want to get to know the why behind it goes and don't get me wrong sometimes stocks just go up because the market goes up but if this one tends to go up more than the stocks around it that it competes against which is another question to ask yourself is it that stock or is it that category going up right and you can go to places like yahoo finance and it'll show you stocks that it competes against the stocks and generally do the same thing or something similar i would look and see i'd really oh gee start digging into why it goes up because at some point you and i both know it's going to go down and when it does, I need to know that too. Like the more I know yeah. the heartbeat of this company, the better off I'm going to be. Yeah. I mean, I'm a much bigger fan of doing what you're doing, only just exchange the ticker symbol of whatever stock that you're doing to whatever sector it's in or whatever industry it's in or the US market or, you know, whatever, or small companies or something like get a broader based investment policy as opposed to one individual stock. Now, if it's but just... If he's Fun money, right? Yeah, like it, that's sounds what you're like, it sounds like if he's just doing 20 bucks, I mean, I'm hoping 20 bucks is his fun money that he's putting in this. Yeah, could be. Then I'm with you. I would want to know, you know, why it's doing what it's doing, not just that it happens to be doing it. Because the other frustrating thing you're talking about comparing it to the other stocks in its industry, what if it's going up 1% a month and the rest of the industry has been going up at 5% a month? Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, I'm doing great. And then you find out that it's, it's you know... It's not. It's actually at the bottom. I remember meeting with somebody back um, in the around 2005 ish, I think, and they had owned uh, uh, Japan and they were super excited that they own the number one Japan ETF. And uh, and I said, why do you own Japan is the home of stagflation, especially, you know, at that time. Remember, I mean, Japan, you know something about Japan? Their stock market just crossed the high that they made in 1990. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Japan, Japan. Just crossed it. Did nothing for so long. He's like, but it's the number one fund. And and I had to seriously go over why it wasn't a good idea to own Japan at all. But he was, he was so convinced that he had the number one thing. So the opposite of what you're saying is going up one versus everything else going up five. Yeah. If you've got the number one thing, but it's something you don't need in your portfolio. But I don't think that that's the case. And with 20 bucks, Zach, I think that's fun. Listen, anytime that you can get to know this stuff better and do it on something like 20 bucks a week, how great is that? But I would I would dig into the heartbeat of the stock. There's a second type of analysis also that people do, and I referenced it earlier when I said momentum's a real thing. Stocks that start going up tend to continue going up. That's called a momentum play. These quote plays though are technical analysis and technical analysis is when you look at the charts, you look at the graphs, things like the stochastic, the little candlesticks, you see these theories like the upside down teacup and things like that. These, these things actually work, but the reason they work is because so many traders believe they work. It's complete voodoo, absolute voodoo, but because so many people believe in the voodoo, it's this self-replicating game that traders play. I wouldn't pay a lot of attention to that type of analysis. So Zach, uh, fundamental analysis is where you get to know your company, know who runs it, know what they do, know who their customers are, know why they would succeed, why they don't. So that when you see economic conditions change over time, you can make adjustments to your portfolio accordingly. Thanks for the question, Zach. If you've got a question for us, 
That one caught me by surprise. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh, Zach is getting some swag from Gertrude. Show off that stacker pride. Speaking of being a stacker, you want to be here again next Wednesday night. It's coming up quick. We've got a fantastic lineup on YouTube live event. But if you tell us you're coming early, we're also going to throw in some tools that you can use to get ahead. Part of me wants to tell you what the tools are because they're they're well, you and I are both tools. <laughs> so you get two tools that night. I took the joke off the table for everybody. <laughs> like I know the tools. There's two tools there uh, either. You get two tools that night and then you get uh two fantastic guests and a, a guest co host that uh, that are gonna make up for us. But stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stack that not only lets mom know that you're coming, it also gets you in on uh, the tools for people that tell us early that you're on the way. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. If you can show up, that's great. If you can tell us at a time, even better. Also, mom's bragging about another review, OG. Five stars from Growl with about 12 hours. Love to stack those Benjamins. Stacking Benjamin is such fun to listen to. They're the headlines. Joe and OG break down some news tidbits. They say you won't learn anything, but I frequently do. Then there's a headline guest or fintech segment, which provides such an interesting variety. Joe does a great job interviewing. You can tell he really prepares. There's something for everyone. Sometimes it's applicable to me, but our time's more for somebody at a different stage of life than I. Of course, there's Doug's crazy trivia. Don't learn anything there really applicable to life, but it's fun. Finally, there's the Haven Lifeline where they answer a listener question. OG especially has a great way of enlightening us. Dare I say, again, I often learn something. All this dished out in a fun way, which makes me want to listen and look forward to the next one. Growl, you are now our BFF. I feel like we all growl 10 bucks for that one, don't you? Holy cow. You can pay the 10 bucks. <laughs> nice job. Mom is uh, mom's blushing as she's showing that off on her Zoom calls. Leaving us a review Great way to tell people what they're getting into with the Stacking Benjamin Show. Even better yet, if you've got a friend, either somebody who's selling a business, looking at, uh, likes looking at their family financial picture from a business perspective, maybe the John Warlow interview. Good for them for today. By the way, we're also going to put uh, that interview on our YouTube channel so you can watch John and I talk. Same interview but we're trying to record some of those OG from time to time, put up at least one new video a week over on YouTube. Plus, of course, as I mentioned, that's where the stack's going to be. Lastly, OG and his team taking on clients. And if you're somebody that's looking at your financial picture and you're like, you know what? I'm buying too many random stocks and I probably need to have a dovetailed philosophy. Maybe I want to stop suing people who, su who succeeded at GameStop. No, too soon. Not the right message? Maybe not. <laughs> I could either sue somebody or I could get a financial plan. Hmm. Depends on which one's faster. OG, OG and his team taking on new clients. You owe it to yourself to have good people in your corner if you're looking for those people and want to see how OG and his team work and can interface to make you better with your money. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash OG. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Yeah, sure thing, Joe. I'll keep carrying this podcast on my back. First, take a lesson from our headlines. Mess up on your trades? Put on your big boy or big girl pants. No need to sue anybody when you made the wrong call. Second, take a lesson from John Warlow. The more you create systems and take yourself out of processes, the better things will go. And it's the same thing for your own money. But the big lesson? What's really going to build this show? One answer. More cowbell. Big thanks to John Warlow for joining us today. To learn more about John's podcast, Built to Sell, or his new book, The Art of Selling Your Business, head to our show notes page or go to buildtosell.com. And I hope you can join us a week from tonight for an evening of fun, money lessons, and the best chat discussion of any money event. It's called The Stack because we stack so much into 70 minutes. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. 
giveaways, great guests, and hopefully you. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stack to RSVP and we'll send you some pre-night money tips and a reminder when the event's getting ready to start. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahigh, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it appears I've fallen and I can't get up. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Special thanks to Joe's mom for bringing scented candles down to the basement. Nothing says podcasting with a bunch of dudes like scented candles. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. You and I were just talking about uh, nicknames and um, there's a friend of mine who we now routinely call the torpedo. Oh, the torpedo. Oh boy. Dude, this isn't me. I know because I've never been called the torpedo in my life. I don't know that you've even met this guy when you're here. He comes to game night sometimes, but I don't think he came to the same ones that you've been to. I never get invited to game night, so it's well, cool. we haven't had one in over a year. I just sure I'm sure, I'm, sure. I'm I'm shaking, waiting yeah. for hoping for another game night. Yeah, you're I haven't like had one in a year. You're like, you're like whatever. You definitely get invited to the next one. As if you pretend there's a pandemic, so you don't have to yeah. invite me. Yeah, it's right. a pretty long con, Joe. Pretty <laughs> long con. I worked that thing, did I? Yeah, you. Did. I totally worked that. Yes. So we are running, we're running, getting ready for the Disney marathon. And some people ran the half marathon. Some people ran the marathon. Some people ran both. In fact, a few of us friends ran something called the goofy where you run the half marathon on Saturday and the marathon on Sunday. And for people going, Oh my God, that sounds horrible. It's not as bad as you think. If you can run a marathon, which I know (laughs) there we go already. We've got a bunch of people going, yep, it is bad. But if you can do that, you can run the goofy. It's, it's not that difficult but anyway so our it's friend not, doug quit being modest it was a, quite an accomplishment joe you like that flex yes it isn't that difficult you know we ran for eight days up food and water but it was fine so our friend doug who's a very serious guy super nice guy not neighbor doug different doug no not neighbor doug Got yeah it. yeah we refer to neighbor doug as a very serious guy <laughs> different doug so we're running down the road Oh, by the way, for this particular marathon, just to set this up, you got to get up at like two o'clock in the morning because they want to have people through the theme parks or at least to Epcot where you're getting ready to finish by the time the things open. They want to have everybody done by noon so that, you know, all the theme park traffic doesn't intersect with a ton of runners. So strike two. So basically you got to run for 26 miles and you have to be up at two in the morning. And you got to be up at two in the morning. Hard pass. And I don't remember if the race starts at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. or it it starts at some ungodly hour, but, and you got to walk like a mile and a half to the starting line. But other than that, it's amazing. You get the the rest of the story, PG rated, PG 13, like where are we headed? PG rated, but some, uh, some humor. Got it. Some kid humor type of humor kids like to have. So you get up at 2 a.m., you get your fluids, you get out there, you're in this huge mass of 20,000 people waiting for the start of this race. There is, there are portageons out there, but they are 
super long lines at the start. So they start this marathon because there's so many people, OG, they start it in waves. One wave goes, they wait five minutes, they do the next wave, they do the next wave, they do the next wave. And every, every wave, the, the fireworks go off. So we're in like corral F. So we watch wave after wave going in front of us and you walk toward the starting line. And I noticed the wave before us and the wave before that, the second that the fireworks go off, a bunch of people take off to the right because there's a woods over to the right. These people have been out since 2 a.m. It's now 5 a.m. A lot of people start the race immediately by finding their own little toilet. <laughs> so we get about seven miles in and uh, we're chatting. And my friend Troy goes, you know, I think I got to I think I got to go. I'm like, you know, it's funny. I got to go, too. And we see there's this woods over on the right. And you see a few people. You see a few people standing alongside the woods with their back toward you, right? Looking for golf balls. Yes, absolutely. So Troy and I take off and we're standing on the edge of the woods with our back to the stream of runners going by when all of a sudden Doug goes flying into the woods, just right between us, just flies into the woods and far enough that he disappears. I'm still going to the bathroom like seven seconds later when he comes shooting back out of the woods, pulling his pants up. We're, we're like, what, what the, we finally get all back together on the, on the race course. There's so many people, by the way, that you'll get lost. So we made this deal that when anybody in our pack goes to the bathroom, everybody runs along the right-hand side of the road, the white line, you know, the edge of the road. And so we just run on that line. Cause otherwise if you search the road, you're, you're never going to find your, your group. So we finally catch up. We get back together. We're like, what the hell? Well, it turns out that while he and I were doing a certain liquid form of number one urination. He was two in a big old number two, which is how he got the nickname, the torpedo. And I didn't think it would stick when I called him a torpedo that day. But, but now I realize it's, it's like seven years later. And every time we see Doug, we all always go, Hey, torpedo, what's happening, man. The same way that they give uh, fighter pilots their nicknames. Is that how? Yeah, it has to do with pooping, I'm sure. <laughs> Top Gun. Maverick. How did Goose get his name? 